Praise the Lord, my friend. Thomas Manton IV. I want to speak on the subject of the uh, most vital thing. Someone thinks uh, a lot of topics are the vital thing, but and they are. But I think before anything gets achieved, you have to start with this. God made Adam to handle his garden, his, well, you think of a garden, you think of a small place, but it was more than that. I mean, it was, it was vast, it was magnanimous. And then uh, benefit of the beginning of that was beyond anything. And it was that which also included everything. So people think, well, I want to make money, I want to be successful, I want to have a family, I want to have business, I want to have a church, I want to have a ministry, I want to have an organization, I want to have fun, I want to travel, I want to have a vacation, I want to have... Now, I want to tell you the master ingredient in all of that, that you can't have any of it without it. I bet if I were asked by show of hands how many would guess, I think somebody might get it, but a lot of people may not. Because it may not come right to the tip of your, you know, imagination. But the Lord spoke to me this week, oh my God, he's been talking to me all week. What a privilege it is for you, all you good people, to hear the voice of God when I come back on in the next broadcast, because God's been talking to me a lot between the last one and the current one. And this whole week, I've been hearing this very clearly, and it's been confirmed to me in so many ways, through so many voices. I want to say something before I talk, before I drop the, uh, you know, <laughs> the line, the package <laughs> from heaven. If, if anybody thinks that, like, they're, like, masterly vital and things are only moving at the pace of what they're doing, what a deception that is because God has to have his own program moving on the way he wants. And if you don't have a lot of working mechanisms in the equation of a great life, you know, you, you, you're just missing so much. So I feel peace because, like, I'm not dependent on a few of these jokers that want to say this and that, or a few people that can do this or that, and even great people that can do this or that. None of it's enough. When God's working in, like, an, an awesome, almost unfathomable way, it happens through many different tributaries, many different people, many different scenarios. And it's all based on this one thing. Nothing happens without people. Nothing happens without relationships. Nothing happens without power-filled, productive, and purpose-filled connections divinely, relationships of people. And the Lord spoke to me so clearly to speak about this now. I want to entitle this, The Power of Productive Relationships. And of course, I'll say it's volume one in case there's a volume two, and there probably will be. But you know, the Lord made Adam with such wonderful splendor and strength. All the things that were there in the garden, but he couldn't handle it all because he didn't have that other relationship. So the one that God made even from him and put her together and made him a completer, not a competitor, not a competitor, not a divisionary tactic of the devil, although she got divided by the devil. But still, she had the power to complete the man and make him something more productive than he was before. 
I heard this statement in a, in a, in a conference of multi-millionaires that I've been listening to the last couple of days, something that I um, registered for because I couldn't be there, but uh, it's on the other side of the planet. <laughs> I'm on the other side, halfway, halfway around the world, on the other side of the planet, at least halfway around the world, even more than that. Probably 10,000 miles I am now from the conference where it's being held. Yeah, 10,000 miles, exact, probably exactly 10,000 miles, give or take a few. And something was said was, nothing could be achieved without other people. Not possible. Everything has a structure. Everything has an order. Everything has an organization. Everything has a... Um, a way, to, a, way to, a way to get things done. And it's really through brilliant people. Now, the quality of your friendships and the quality of your relationships will often determine the level that you go to. You hang around with morons, you're going to be somewhat moronic. There's even a demon called Moroni, right? <laughs> it birthed the whole religion sect after, the, more after the, the demon of moron. If you hang around dull people, Jesus, you'll be frustrated because if you're switched on by God, like I am, you, you can never be like dulled down or made into something you're not. You'll just, you'll just be without a lot of results of things you need to get done. So you need to find that tribe, that company, that people. So at 3.36 a.m. this morning, I was starting to feel the transition like I should, I'm about to transition over into sleep and I just have, sometimes I just have to wait until I, until I get there because I'm so wound up from the whole day. I looked at my phone, I had like three phones there, I looked at one of my phones and and it's 3.36 a.m. And I just finished listening to, now I gotta clear something here. Uh, what the media paints people as is very tragic many times because they'll come up with something that they wanna say or some devil wanted to say or some sick, psycho, psychotic, twisted person wanted to say about somebody and give a, an impression of, of somebody to people that's not even real. And this one man who's like a real go-getter, he decided to bring this guy out. I was shocked. I had the thing on live on my phone. And uh, he brings him out. He said, I'm going to bring out someone great, someone huge, someone magnanimous. We're like, who is it? We're, everybody's like, who is it? And they didn't announce it before. They didn't announce it in the program, probably for good reason. In case, what if he can't make it? He's such a big guy. What if something happens and he can't show up? But he was contracted to come, and, but they didn't announce it in the program. And I'm glad they didn't. What a great surprise, and I'm glad that I was watching anyway, no matter who was gonna be there, someone that I knew or someone that I didn't know. Because only, only giants that are extremely successful in business were gonna speak there. Anyway, if you're on the stage with a microphone in that event, you're a multi, multi-millionaire, extremely successful, and you're there to share the brilliance of what you've done and succeeded in. There's no wannabes there. Where I've seen a lot of wannabes is in the church. Wannabe Incorporated. I don't know how you spell that. W-A-N-N-A-B-E-E -E dot com, you know, or dot, or dot whatever, dot stupid. Praise the Lord. Nothing like a bunch of broke church folks. So here I've listened to this man. I'll say his name in a minute. He, he was asked how, how he was, a, he's an A-list uh, actor, by the way. Well, one of the most famous on earth of, of, of any generation. He may not be seen as the best, you know, the best of the best kind of guy, but he, he's in the game. He's been in it for a long time. And he's extremely, extraordinarily successful. Extremely and extraordinarily successful. So, so the guy, the, the host asked him, what's your box office total, your movies? How much have they amassed? in box office sales, ticket sales. He looked at him and said, $10 billion. I thought, oh. 
That's the guy who knows something about money. Generating money. And he signed up for one uh, to be an ambassador for a major airline because he's a pilot. He has uh, three major mega jets. One is a 707. Uh, it's a huge, like that's a huge, you know. And the company he had an idea to go talk to that he got that he bought it from. The, the CEO said to him, "Let me give me a month, uh, a few weeks to consider what you've said to me," because he proposed something to him. The actor proposed something to the CEO of this major airline in another country. He said, "Give me a few weeks. Um, give me give me one month. Give me thirty days. I'm going to come back to you." Thirty days exactly came back. He said, "Well, we don't know what to give you for what you've offered." Because he, he was going there say, can I give you like uh, this amount of money that you'll let me use your name and put it on my jet? Because I feel like I bought it from you guys and it's boring just seeing the corporate, you know, flat paint. I want to have some kind of logo on this. So I, I had this idea, brilliant idea, yeah? I said, I, I could come and ask if we can use your name. And the guy says, uh, excuse me, sir, uh, Mr. A-list actor, don't you think it's the other way around? We should be paying you to be flying around on our jet, we should pay you. So just give me 30 days, I'm gonna figure out what we can do. He said, it, we should really be giving you something, not you giving us something. Is that okay? He said, well, if you say so. Sure, and everybody laughed, you know, he said it very humbly, of course. So this guy said to him, he said, well, we don't know what to give you, but the, first, the only th main thought we had was, can we give you a 747 jet? Give you one, like give you one. Like a hundred million dollar plane, I give you one. He, he thought, no, no, well, thank you for the offer, but I really would like to keep the one I have. And he said, this costs me three million to five million dollars a year for upkeep just to run it. And I'm really a little bit tired of that. So I'll make you a deal. Keep the 747, let's keep the one I have. Can you take over the maintenance on that and run it for me? And I'll have your name on my jet anywhere I go. People are going to be seeing you. The guy said, that's a fabulous deal, and they did it. So now he just got, he just got himself $5 million a year. <laughs> In other words, zero cost to maintain his jet. He was talking about net jets. Um, that's a, a, a charter company. He says, I don't like to charter. I like to own my planes. So that's not for everybody because now you're becoming like a small airline. You have to think about pilots, you, you have to think about maintenance, you have to, you know, all the expenses of it, taking care of them. He said, I just prefer to own my jets. This guy has gone so far that he has a runway, a jetway runway at his house. So he drops his plane, flies his plane and lands on his own airstrip and pulls the jet right up to his front door, gets out of the plane, down the stairs, walks into his mansion. Someone lift your hand and say, that's another level. Now, how did he get there? He got there by developing in his mind, but he had to break, first, break forth first into the realm of success, which he, which he did very passionately. But then, you know, these people think on a different level. So the point I'm trying to make is, I could say a lot more about that. The point I'm trying to make is, and then he went to Boeing company. Boeing is the largest aircraft manufacturer on earth. And he said, I wasn't really going to be greedy to try to, you know, hustle them for so much money. I said, let me make it like a seed. Whatever they offer me, I'll just say yes. Humble guy, brilliant guy. He said, but they've never had a brand ambassador for their company, Boeing Airline, Boeing Airline Corporation. They've never had one in the history of their company. So the fact that they make him this is going to bring him a lot of money and a lot of other things. Some things lead to something else. Something you, he said, I even did something for free once. He made a, 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 a movie that really became a hit. And he didn't know it was going to become a hit. And he said he was only paid $140,000. Each actor was paid $140,000. And that's all they were going to get paid. But when you know guys uh, can make tens of millions per movie. But what happened is, that movie was such a hit. For his 140000 he gladly made it. Humbly said, I'm not going to ask them for anything else. I'm not going to say, ah, how could you give me that low amount of money? Are you kidding me? He said he just took it. It became a hit. Then, then he said, for the next 10 years after that, 
He was the highest paid actor in Hollywood. Lift your hands. He was the highest paid actor on earth because that movie took off and gave him all these other strings of movies to make. And he said the total of his box office of all his combined movies is over $10 billion. Then he said the ancillary uh, things and sales and, you know, products and offshoots of business from, you know, the, the brands of the movies and all that. He said that added a lot more to it, so it was way more than $10 billion. I thought, this guy, this guy's amazing. So he said he signed up with another agency, he changed his agency to another agency, he named the name of the new agency. The agency said that 40 people have a meeting with him. And he said, they said to him, what, what would you like our agency to do for you? You know, they have to impress the guy. He just came over like he's going to sign with them now. So a very famous, famous, famous man. So, I mean, whatever he touches, it turns to gold. Whatever he, wherever he shows up, he has that clout. So for this agency to have him, they want to give him as, as much as he would ask for. Do you know what he said? He said, myself, I'm okay. I'm already out there, already made it, already done it all. You know, my name speaks for itself. I can do what I, you know, I'm, I'm going to do what I'm going to do anyway. He said, what I want you to do is take care of my kids. He said, my son and my, the son, his son and his daughter, I want to make sure that you take good care of them. And he says, now, this, this really got me. He said, now, they're already very wealthy. So you don't have to, like, uh, toy around with them about money or how much money they're going to make on something. They're very wealthy. They're my children. Yeah. So he says, but I want to make sure that you help them, guide them into their career, whatever they're going to do in a very, very good way. Is that a deal? He said, what do you want us to do for you? He said, I'm okay. You figure it out, but I'm really concerned about them. What a guy. So he's talking about he's doing this, he's doing that. He's also in the realm of business as well as being an actor, and the, the, the host of the meeting was saying, this guy's a master negotiator. You wouldn't, you wouldn't know that. But he came off, his whole attitude was humble. He said, I'm into integrity. I'm into integrity of everything, how I operate, the brand, my name, everything is, has to be above board and very integrative. And then he's just sitting there so smooth and so humble and speaking so eloquently and so nice. And you wouldn't even know that it was, here's the name, John Travolta. The actor, John Travolta. When you see some things about him, you think about his, uh, this movie and that movie, and then people want to say this and say that about, like, one of his children had a problem or he had a personal problem, whatever. And that, that's what he gets labeled at. You don't know the behind the scenes of the man that I got to see for, like, 45 minutes. Just listening to him talk was life-changing. I thought, this guy is on another level. Now, let me get back to my church point. So I rang one of my people in America, and I said, uh, it was at 3.30 a.m., and I, I said, let me, uh, uh, something I need them to do for me. So uh, they didn't answer right away. They're probably doing, they're in a meeting or at the office or whatever. They called right back, but they called right back a few, a couple of minutes. And they said, well, I have this thing about doing something, something for one of my vehicles. I said, Let's do it like this. I want to. I want to get it done. You know, you you could do that while I'm, while I'm away, and because uh, it's just sitting there. They said, "Well, I have this idea how I can do. It. It's something simple like changing the tires. You know, it's not a big deal. It's something simple like a little maintenance for it. You know, uh, take it, get it on the road, change the tires, drive it. You know, clean it up and all that. You know, simple." They said, "Well, I can do it. I can get there this way." Uh, and then come back because the thought of me sitting in the car with these other people, and I know who they're talking about, I started to laugh. I thought, oh my God. And these are the kind of people that can't get out of their own way. They have no money. They have no business. They're just living like that. But they're very spiritual. Lift your hand. Very spiritual. They know uh, church, you know, they know... They'll even know the anointing. You know, one time I walked out of a meeting, I walked by them, and the guy started shaking like this. He's a very beautiful guy. He's a great guy. He does great work. But they don't have anything in the realm of what I just talked about, these two different worlds. I think it's high time God wants to bridge the gap between that world and this world. 
It's not just for someone in the world system, as we'd say, the secular arena, the non-religious arena or whatever, that, that makes somebody, you know, become so highly successful and everybody else that's going to church, they're just broken. They don't know how to even how to get one foot in front of the other hardly. Got a broken down car, broken down life, broken down finances, broken down everything. Hello, even broken down relationships. Oh, yes. So I don't see where God fits into that equation. But spiritual people, beautiful people, beautiful hearts, you can count on them. They're zealous to help. You understand, I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything bad, bad about them at all in the realm of the love of God that's in them and the ability that they have in them. But as far as business, the business life, it's not there. So I, I was in a conference and I walked past this guy. He started to shake and he said, uh, is this terminology? He said, are you, I, I, can't, oh, no, I don't want to say the way he said it talking about the anointing, you know, and he started to shake and started like he's going to fall down, like he's getting hit, because the power of God was so strong upon me. That happens a lot. Sometimes I'm, I'm not even trying to work it up or pray and do all this. I'm just, I'm just there, and God's there with me, and things begin to happen. So I'm like, wow. So here I, so I, so I told my person on the phone, I said, you know what? I just came out of this session online with this. And I it described a few things, like a few things that I just said, in a much shorter couple, a few sentences. And I said, I really can't wrap my mind around that. <laughs> Let me stay here. And I woke up with these words on my lips. I was walking around, I was speaking. I said, you know, I'm not called to be poor. I never was. I'm called to be extravagantly wealthy. Somebody lift your hands if you can claim that. Extravagantly wealthy. Extravagantly wealthy. I don't mean like, like I have enough money to buy this and that, even property, even things, whatever. I, I'm supposed to have more than that. My life is supposed to be a wonderful place. And one thing Mr. Travolta said, he said, I wish that everybody would be rich. Because it gives you a lot of options. It gives you a lot of security. Like you need security, like he needs security because he's such a famous person. He needs his planes, he needs the maintenance, he needs to take care of that, he needs to have his, his house, his family, you, know, you understand? And security, and even, even for health, he said for medical things and all that, for your health and all that. There's, whatever would, would have to be fixed or done, there's no limit to what I can do with myself on a daily basis because I have the money. And he's not talking about small money, a few thousand, he's talking about hundreds of millions of dollars, yeah? I have enough that anything I wanna do, I can do it. Now one thing he didn't talk about was any relationship, except he talked about his parents' approval, which was great. You know, you know something else he told about himself is amazing. He's a high school dropout. There goes your education. Uh, there goes your education importance doctrine right there, right? He dropped out of high school. He went into the acting world when he was 16 years old. And his father is. He made a deal with his father. His father didn't agree. He said, but his mother went to his dad and said, he has a gift and a dream. Let it. Let's let him go and do it because he was going to walk away from high school and just go right into the acting world. So he made a deal with his dad. His dad didn't agree. His dad didn't like that at all. My father was also like that. My father chased me when I was younger to get me into college. I was somewhere. He had to find me. <laughs> I was somewhere doing something. He had to come and find me. He came to find me because it was like the last day of the registration uh, into the university, big university, a powerful university. And I graduated from there with Bachelor of Arts and some master's degree and uh, uh, part of that, and a couple of different majors, you know, and I was there a long time, I did a lot of studies, and my father was so happy about that, because he graduated from there, he became very successful. So he was like, there's no way he's letting his son, Thomas Jr., to, not to go to college. Yeah, 
It's a very expensive college, by the way. It is like the top Ivy League kind of thing, uh, going toward that level. So the last day there was a registration, he couldn't find me. He was trying to get me. Back then we didn't have cell phones, you know. Nobody had a cell phone. It's all like landline or where you are or go try to find somebody. How many, no, some of you are not, some of you are not uh, ancient enough to know that about that. You always had the cell phone and the way to find someone and you can call 20 other people on their cell phones and you can get through to somebody easier. But, but in a day when nobody had cell phones, the first one that came out, it was like the size of this Bible, you know? <laughs> it was like, like a brick, like a brick, you'd hold it up to your ear, you probably, your hands start to shake after a while. And they used to get real hot. You know, it looked like a walkie-talkie from the military with an antenna on the top and you hold it like that. It looked really weird. And they were stupid expensive. They were like, they started out being like $4,000. This was in the 1980s. The first one was about $4,000, two, three, four thousand dollars for, 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 a, for a, you know, because it was a new thing. Now they got it into like this, okay? Small like this, and they have competitive things in the market, so even for $1,000, you can get the best one in the world. Either the new iPhone or the new Note 8, new, uh, what is it, Note 10 now, or something like that. So my father was like that too, but he, he, he made a deal with his father. He said, hey, just give me one year. By the next time they're gonna enroll again for the next year, if I didn't make it by then, and I'm not doing okay by then, I'll come back, submit to you, and I'll do anything you, I'll, I'll do anything you tell me to do in the realm of the education. Well, the rest is history. He never got to do it because he went, he got hired in one thing. He said he was making 50 bucks a week. Then he went to like $275 a week. This is way, this is back in the 70s, yeah? And then he got to $390 a week. Then he was like, wow, I'm on top, you know, $400 a week. Could you imagine compared to what he's making now? He said, but then, then the, he had, well, he, he did say something. He had a coach, he had a, uh, an agent or a coach who said, I see for you television and movies. Because he was doing like stage, you know, like uh, live appearances on stage, you know, the Broadway st uh, plays kind of thing. And he said, once I got into the television market and hit it, he said, back then, people, they had, uh, the, the television in America would have three channels, three or four channels. So he said, when you're on in a major prime time slot on one of them, like 30 or 40 million people be watching your show. Now they di divided it up. If you do CNN's numbers now, or even the TBNs and the God TVs and the Day Stars, you know, of the Christian, the big Christian television networks, if you knew what their real stats are, their numbers are, you'd be shocked how few people are watching. Everything is on the phone now. If somebody said Twitter is like down like 12% of the, of the audience, he said, but Facebook's gone up to like 65, 62%, 61%. He said it was at about 50% of people were looking at Facebook all the time. He said that climbed in the last year or two to like over 60%. It went up 12% points in the last year or two. So he said, all the people that are watching anything, they're on Facebook. Now Facebook, when it first came out, you could post anything and it would go viral and have a lot of traffic, but then they put all these algorithms and things in there and they wanted people to advertise. That's why they made so much money. That's why Zuckerberg is one of the richest men in the world now. And Facebook is like a trillion dollar entity because of the advertising thing. So he said, no longer can you just put a post on, someone says, well, I'll put a post and a lot of people will see it, they don't. And then I'll put a post and then, uh, or I'll put more and then more will see it. Well, it doesn't work like that. I heard someone else talking about this, about the, the realm of social media marketing. He said, now it's been made pay to play. So he says, you need to go to other ones like Instagram and, and uh, LinkedIn. LinkedIn is, is coming up in the world. He said, but Twitter's way down there. He said, Twitter's not a good place to advertise. Guess who said this? President Donald Trump's campaign manager this year. His name is Brad Parshall, something like that. I get the right spelling of his name. Brilliant guy. And he said that they're, they're going to spend $1 billion 
on advertising in the Trump campaign for this 2020 election. A billion dollars. Then the host of the meeting, they, and then another guy was talking about emails, the resurgence of email marketing, really good. I agree with that. I agree with that because an email has an end. Social media has no end. You ever, you ever click up, up in a video and then you see the next video and then it keeps presenting and you could scroll down and you could be watching for hours, wasting your time watching these stupid video clips. And you got to grab a hold of yourself and say, hey, what am I doing? But an email could take you three minutes, four minutes. Even if there's a video clip, you'll see that. And you get to the end. There is an end. There is a bottom of the page that you get to and you can process whatever. So he said it's a very intimate thing. And he said people that are reading emails are people with money. You know, the, the local jerk could just have his own, you know, the local, you know what I mean? The local Joe, <laughs> I shouldn't say that. The local Joe, or, or whatever your name is, can, can uh, you know, be just looking at this thing because they have the internet turned on, or they're using somebody's Wi-Fi, or they're using their data minutes, whatever, their data uh, uh, bandwidth that they bought, you know. And it's endless, so you, you lose track of your time, but an email is like a business thing, you're gonna read through it. So this guy was saying there's a resurgence of that. Then the host came back afterwards. He said, you, you think this guy was just talking? Let me tell you something. Our organization has sent out, listen to what he said, 177 million email. He said, my office, this is the host of the conference, said, my office has sent out 100, 177 million emails. So he says, I'm a firm believer in what he was just telling you. And of course, the host of the conference knows everything that's going to be talked about. He's the one that chooses the people to speak, and he knows exactly uh, you know, what they're going to present, what they're going to talk about. So he said, let me tell you, it works. Let me tell you something. The man that said that he sent out 177 emails last year, not even this year, a year ago, I was with him in, a, in another city, and uh, I was actually there in the convention. And, and, and he said, uh, we made, I, I made $55 million this year, personally, $55 million. I know to this year it's much more than that. He may give it out, say the number. I made $55 million. He said 20 million was just off of social media advertising. He made profit of 20 million dollars just from that. And here we are, la la la, kicking rocks, walking around, not knowing what to do with anything in the church. Well, not me. I'm skyrocketing to, I'm launching out to another level. I just, Y'all don't know this, you know. If you get scared, good. Shake in your shoes. I don't care. I'm going to tell it. I, I don't want to keep it back. I've had meetings the last few days. People, I just had a meet, another one today. Today about 11, 12 o'clock, I had a, a meeting with someone. They were speaking the most amazing things. I had a meeting with them on Friday. And for over an hour, they were speaking uh, the most brilliant things about vision and details, a brilliant switched on person, a high level, a high level friend, a high level friend, a high level friend, a high level friend, please understand, a high level person, a high level friend. And not everybody's like that, but you have to have those kind of people in your world. Now, we like to function more in the church about, you know, servanthood, reliability, and attendance and being there and you know being having a good attitude and being passionate that's all good that's part of it but the skill and the expertise of the what to and the how to and the when to and the where to without that where are you really going so while people are playing church or having their church you know scenarios going on that's okay it's fine i'm i'm i'm, I'm launching out to another dimension not as a pastor of a church, but as a prophet to the nations, 
And this person said to me, said, I see you as an apostle. Are you an apostle? I said, I just looked at them. I didn't answer. I'm drinking my coffee going, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to jump on that. Most people have been so insecure, they jump all over that. Yes, I am. I'm me. I'm the Reverend Dr. Apostle. Oh, come, shut up. I just listen. I'm listening. I'm like, continue. I'm recording. Continue. I'm documenting all this. They don't know. I didn't, I didn't say that, but I'm just saying, yeah, just keep going. I'm getting it. And they said, I see you as a teacher of teachers. I see you with this like curriculum to teach people. And that's, that goes in line with another prophecy I received about uh, uh, mentoring people all over the world. Several times last year, I, I received that prophecy in different places from different servants of God. One apostle somewhere uh, in North America, somebody else from South America, someone else from Europe, someone else from Africa, someone else from another place in Africa. It's just, it's just like that. Bang, 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 confirming the same thing. So now, two, two or three things we need to accomplish that. Number one, uh, the premise of this is productive relationships. Write the word somewhere. Productive relationships. You have to have. Wise people also. Proverbs, uh, where, where are we at here? Proverbs 11. I'm just kicking around a few things. Talks about the person who's devoid of wisdom, what they're like. And the person who's a man of understanding, what he's like. Wisdom is the principal thing. I saw something in the book of Daniel that I really like. Uh, Daniel chapter 2, verse uh, 20, it said, Blessed be the name of the Lord God forever, forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. Wisdom and might, which is strength, are his, but they're also ours. He says he changes the times and seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. I like that. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the heart. Well, he, he knows what is in the darkness, and, but the light dwells with him, in him. He removes and he sets up. One thing I'm finding out, I found out, and I know this, and, I'm, and I'm, it's becoming more, uh, more of, a, of a revelatory thought to me more and more, you don't have to concern yourself with who's who and what's what and what you see. You have to know what's on the inside of you. You have to know what God's ordained you to do. Guess what? You're only responsible to fulfill the will of God. You're not responsible to do anything else. You're not responsible to people that you're supposed to build something and uphold it. If you did it, you got to take care of it. You know Psalm 127, what did it say? Unless the Lord build the house. Is it Psalm 127, I think? Let's put that on the screen if we can find it. Psalm 127, I think it was. I'm not going to take time and turn there right now. But uh, it says, except the Lord build the house, they that labor, labor in vain. And then there's another scripture that I really fell in love with again. He inhabits the praises of his people. Now, how can you praise God unless you're doing a faith act when you're going through a trial? Or else you're just so happy you want to praise him and thank him. Every day I stop myself somewhere in the day to thank God for anything that I have. You know, I drive my car. It doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter what's going on out there, what you're still believing for, or what didn't happen yet. Come on. I, I'm driving in a nice car. I have food to eat. I have a house. I have this. I have that. Everything is great. Praise God. And I'm just like, thank you, Lord, for this. Thank, don't you think he takes note of that? Thank you, Lord, for this. A lot of people don't have these things. And who am I to think that I'm not fulfilled because I don't have the next thing that I want yet? i got to thank God for what I have now. That's wisdom in and of itself. The beginning of wisdom, the secret of him, Psalm 25, the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. When you fear him, you want to thank him for everything he's done. Someone say, thank you, Lord. My God, just lift your hand. Man. Thank you. No matter what you're believing for, no matter what hasn't happened yet, God has still been good to you. He is good, and his mercy endures forever, and he's been good to you in some way or another. You have shoes on your feet, some people don't have. I know, like, we don't like to think, we don't like to think of others. We're like, I, I, I need prosperity, I need success, I need millions, I need, yeah, I know, I know, I know, and we do. And, I, and I'm talking to you to help stretch your imagination to help you get there. On purpose, by design, loving doing it, believing in all of it. But first, you know, let's take a minute to thank God for what he's given us. 
if you ate some food yesterday or today, you're blessed. Because a lot of people in the world don't have any food. If you got shoes on your feet and you can choose what you're going to put on from your closet, and you have a house to sleep in, and somehow your rent or your mortgage or your whatever you got paid, or your property got paid, somehow, some, through whatever means, you need to thank God for that. Let me say this. Let me say this. God it was and is and always will be my provider. Always. But I, I want to go back to this for a minute. He changes the times and the seasons. Oh, yes. If you think you're going to live in the same... Daniel chapter 2, verse... Uh, Daniel chapter 2, verse 21. If you, think you go, if you think you're going to stay in the same season all of your life and just do the same thing and never progress to another level... You don't have the vision of God yet. You don't have it at all. In fact, you're not even dreaming, praying, wishing, hoping, desiring, prophesying, declaring, anything to get there. But I want to say it again, we need this stimulus of good people. We need productive relationships. We need iron that sharpens iron. We need people that have brilliance. We need people that are on a, on, a, on a higher level. When we listen to them, our mind gets stretched. Sometimes, you know, like, uh, very few people are online, by the way, around here. I'm glad I am. We're live, and we're, and we're filming on, on, for television, and we're doing all that, right? Uh, for video, television, whatever you want to say. But uh, on another camera, but, and we're live, we're live on the Internet. A lot of people don't do that. And one of my friends who, who comes on live on the Sunday morning, you know, his church, and, and, and I clicked I, by curiosity, you know, I have a minute, you know, thank God I have a minute, but I don't want to spend too much of my time on things that are not productive for what I need to be doing. Anyway, that's a good message right there. I said, I don't want to spend too much of my time on something that's not productive in what I'm supposed to be doing. I want to say it again. I don't want to spend, in case you, I said it too fast, you didn't get it. I don't want to spend too much of my time on something that, involving myself with something that doesn't have anything to do with what I am supposed to be doing. Hello. But I clicked it and there's my friend. And he's doing his these thou fours and whosoever's kind of preaching, which I don't really enjoy. And he's a very successful man, by the way, this particular gentleman. So he's organized. He's an administrator. He's organized. He's organized to the, to the hilt. But I thought if I went to his church and listened to that kind of preaching all the time, I'd never get any kind of uh, information from that message, you know. It's always this scripture about something, and it's emotional, and then they go into the music, and then everybody's like, Ugh. I'm like, why do you people all come here? You know, I'm not trying to be funny, but I'm thinking, you know, it's cultural. It's connection. People decided to make that their church, and that's wonderful. You need to have a good church. And the pastor's a blessed man. I hope you'll get blessed. But he's not telling about how he got blessed. I, so I have, to, I have to go back. I have to admire people that are productive enough. And yes, it's a business for them. Like this conference I was talking about, this convention I'm talking about. Yes, it's productive for them. They're selling stuff. People are joining. People paid massive amounts of money to attend. The highest level of the tickets, of the, the VIP tickets, are $25,000 to attend the conference for three days. $25,000. That is two and a half million Kenyan shillings you know, for that level, to get that seat. Now that you'll, you'll, you'll get to have a meet and greet with the speakers, you'll get, be in the VIP room, you'll get all your meals included. I think they throw in your hotel, all that beautiful hotel resort. Yeah, but, but that's a lot of money. Then it's like 15,000 is another level, 10,000 is another level, 5,000 is another level. Then it's like... 3,000, 1,000, then this, the ones that's a few hundred is just like the general seats anywhere. And they sold, listen to this, they sold that thing out way before the event. I remember the email that I got 
This event is sold out. Every seat that they had in the place is gone. Somebody bought it. And they spent $7 million to put on the event. $7 million he spent to put on the event. But he's going to make back so much more than that. He's not a stupid guy. <laughs> and he brings someone on a higher level. He has a private jet, like a Gulfstream 5, five or 6. One of them, 500 or 600, whatever. He's got, I think he had one. He had a 200, a Gulfstream 200, and he upgraded it. He got a bigger one. And he said, I'm just trying to manage that thing and deal with that to fly around. He said, you. And here comes John Travolta on another level. He's got three jets, and he pulls up his jet to his house. And the man wanted to go see him to get some wisdom about the air, aircraft industry because he was about to buy a jet. He wanted to find out. Let me get, he said, let me get someone who's done this, that's a veteran in this, really knows what to do about this. I want to get his advice. So he tried to call him, call through an agent, call through a friend, a mutual friend. The guy didn't take his call, couldn't get through. He said, because the guy didn't know who he was. He says, I have to get there. I have to get there. So finally he got there, and Mr. Travolta was gracious enough to give him all of his wisdom. And this is what he said. This is what he said to him, the host. He said, I really like this guy. One reason, because he listens to me. I told him what an emphasis should be about having a jet, and he listened and took it seriously and began to act on that. So he said, he said, while you're looking for which equipment to buy, which uh, aircraft to buy, comparing all the different ones, which one you should, uh, Mr. Travolta said to him, you need to focus on the pilots that you have. You need to, the most important thing is having the best pilots. He said, oh, I'm looking at... The guy said, oh, I'm looking at the wrong place. I'm looking at all these planes. I'm not thinking about who's going to run it, who's going to maintain it, who's going to fly. And he says, thank God I listened to the advice, and now I have what, what, so the, the best pilot of the world and another one to take me around that I'm safe. And they're, they love what I'm doing. You need someone that's for you, for what you're about. They care about everything. Hello, that's, that's half the battle right there. A productive relationship is going to be through someone that cares about you and the mission and the vision that it gets fulfilled, they're going to care. Have it genuinely in their heart that they care for you. Having people that care for you, how many of that's a refreshing thing? Have you ever had somebody really care about you and care for you? And you're just like, wow, this is so beautiful. This is so of God. Because they really care. And they really have my best interest and they really care about me. And, and also for me to get done what I need to get done. They really care. A lot of people don't care. How frivolous people are. You know, they come. I, I see people that come, oh, yes, you know, and they say, oh, yeah, 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 all these swelling words. And then you, you see their priorities or, or desires are somewhere else. You know? So I thought, you, all you need is a structure of a church and anything will do. If it's close to, closer to your house or... Uh, it doesn't matter what they're preaching. And you can have your cultural thing, and, you know, it's not too deep, and it's not too advanced, not stretching you too much, and, you know, nothing rubs you the wrong way anywhere. Because God will often rub you the wrong way to try to rub something bad off of you. Hello? And you can't handle that. Then, hey, I guess, you know, you'll just stay in the realm of shallowness. But these same people that preach, like in these churches, they're, they're not going to teach you anything. You're not going to learn anything like what I'm talking about here. You're not going to learn anything about how to take your life to a higher level. So first this man, this actor that I was talking about, he pushed himself to be extremely successful that he had the world by the throat, you know? He had everybody by the collar because of his success. Now he can write his own ticket. Whatever he wants to have, he's going to have it. A lot of people don't even think like that. So his mother endorsed him. His father took, a, took, a, took the year, or less than a year, because he made it in the, in the thing. He said, I, I'm sorry, I can't come back to just sit home and go to this school and take tests and read books and study in the thing. I don't need, if I ever need the high school thing, like later, 
I could figure out a way to like get, you know, they call it the GED, a thing you can, you know, get your high school diploma if you dropped out. People do that in America because they want to have their certificate to say they're a high school graduate. Or if you ever really need college, I, I, I don't often know why people need college because I took, I was in a lot of college and all that stuff that I was learning there, yeah, it made me more intellectual and knowledgeable in some areas. Not intellectual because intellect is a gift, but more knowledgeable and a wider worldview and knowing different things, but, but not things that I really use in my life on a daily basis. So I don't, I don't know if I really needed it. But I sure would like to have, have back the time that I took in all that and be able to reutilize that time. I'd like to be who I am now, knowing what I know now, and turn the clock back a few decades and say, let's be me, but back then, and have all this extra time along the way. This guy who, who's the head of this uh, organization during this conference, he said, he, he made a statement, he said, if I had the tools of like social media, technology, digital marketing, digital media, and all, if I was utilizing these things correctly, he said, I would have achieved what I achieved 20 years ago. And now he's 60 years old, he said he just, just turned 60 years old. He said, I would have had all of this when I was 40. True? I wish I had it. I wish I had a way to utilize more of this. I wish I could have known what I know now then. So I want to deduct or deduce or uh, extract from what I just said a brilliant principle. If you think you have all day to get something done, and you think you don't need the stimulus and the stimuli of other great people, and if you think you don't need enough productive relationships to get on into the thing that God has for you on a big level, you're, you're, you're crazy. You're not switched on enough yet with the thought of, of, of true success. But we need to feed our mind. You know, like someone said, garbage in, garbage out. What you feed the body, if you feed the body too many things, you know, the communities where they eat too much sugar, too much salt, too much grease, hello, fried everything, that people end up with diabetes, colon problems, blood pressure, sluggishness, and they just die young. Obesity is also very bad. The Lord spoke to me again about how to lose some, a certain amount of pounds, and I'm, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Just for the health benefit. Yeah, you look better, but for the health benefit of it. Ignorance is a killer. Now, ignorance is not knowing. Stupid is when you know and you still do. Ignorance is not knowing. For whatever reason, you don't know. Really, you should know, but stupidity is when you just don't want to change. You don't want to do the right thing. So we need to, we need to have a checkup from the neck up, you know. Checkup from the neck up, from here up, inside here. Uh, and I want to tell you, Dr. Jesus is in the house. He's ready to do it. Can you imagine Jesus, who we call Lord, is also the master businessman? All of these people in the world, whatever religion they're of, or whatever persuasion they're of, or philosophy they're of, uh, whoever, they, whoever they call their God, still they're under the hands of God, created by God, and they stretch their imagination to, this higher, to these higher levels of operation. And you didn't even know about it. If I had not like, gone behind the scenes with this person to listen to what they're saying about being interviewed about certain specific things about how they made it in these different arenas of life, you'd never know about it. So I'm helping to share some good information about somebody that maybe has been labeled or slandered somewhere. And that's all people think about them. When they think of the name, they go, oh yeah, take it or leave it. I made that movie, I didn't like that movie anyway. Oh yeah, they said this about him or that about him. And that, that's all you know. You don't know about the other side of his real world of how he really lives every day and how brilliant and how successful he really is. Sad, isn't it? But it's also scary. I have to tell you something because I have to tell you this because because uh, uh, there are things going on in the world that you didn't know about. 
the, the rock group Deep Purple, who I grew up, when I was growing up, when I was young, they were hot. This is back in, this is a long time ago. This is a few minutes ago, okay. I don't, I don't want to date myself. But uh, carbon date myself. You know, carbon date is when you're trying to get the age of something that's like a thousand years old. You're carbon dating, you know. I don't want to carbon date myself, but but uh, and then I found this, I just saw it this week. 50 years after it was done, it was done in 1970. Now it's 2020. 50 years? Come on. 50 years after they did it, I found out about it. How many people knew about it? I don't know. How many people did anything with it? I don't know. And this group, this guy, they did a, a gospel song. I don't know if they were mocking gospel or church or whatever at the time, but it was all the lyrics about church and Christianity and the preacher and preaching this and doing this, and it was called like Hallelujah or something like that. The name of the song is Hallelujah. I thought, Hallelujah? From this rock group. And the guy, uh, Eon Gillen, he was, the, he was the lead singer for Jesus Christ Superstar, did the best rendition of, uh, of that, uh, of any singer. There were many actors that did it, many that sang the, the, that Jesus Christ Superstar production, but he, he, had, he had such a, an amazing gifted voice. Nobody touched it. In my view, nobody touched him by far, the level that he did things at. The vocal range that he had, the way he did the expression, the way he sang the song with all the emotions and mood. This is a guy that was supposed to be in the world, but was touched by God with that gift. So be very careful. I'm talking about productive relationships. Are you getting this? Be very careful about who you're listening to. Look at them. Look at their worldview. Look at their knowledge level. Look at their success level. Look at... Uh, where they've been, what they know, what they, you know, where they, they can take you somewhere if they've done something. And don't listen to just anybody. I had a guy come up to me the other day, he says, oh, Prophet, I've been looking for you for years, and I, I, I didn't know, you know, what your number was. I said, here's my number. And then he asked me, like, political questions, and I trashed the whole thing. I said, that political thing is not good. He probably went away sad, you know. Never see the guy. And he's complaining how he's like kicking rocks, speaking in these horrible places. He was going to preach in the middle of this market down uh, the street somewhere from somewhere, a horrible place. And I know it's going to be like an iron sheet place with a dirt, muddy floor. Probably smells like an open sewer, which it may be. And that's good. He's going to preach. And they're going to give him nothing for his preaching. And he's got his old jacket on that probably was washed in water. Can't afford dry cleaning. You know, you know the same kind of story. And I thought, could, could a guy like this actually come and listen to me and get connected and mentored and raised up, something great will become, I guarantee, just by the anointing alone, without me even saying much, just the touch of the anointing would catapult him to another level and open doors for him. But we can't see the guy. He can't make it because he doesn't see it. He's telling me, I want to expand and I want to go here and I want to go there and I want to be here and I want to be there. I thought, okay, uh, Great, man. And, I, and I, I said, yeah, I thought about it right away. I discerned. I said, I know why, because everywhere you go in this particular country, they just rip you off and treat you like a dog. Can you imagine a dog has to run around, what you call them, umbos, right, in Swahili? They have to run around looking for, like, you know, crying, looking for something to just eat some junk that might make them sick, and that's how they live. And I thought, some people even live like that. How sad. Because if you leave your hand in the destiny of somebody else, they're not going to do the right thing a lot of the times. So you can never live your life according to the mercy of other people. This also gives you more confidence and more peace and more power to produce because you look at everyone else and said, well, I mean, you're there. Thank God for you. Whatever you're doing or however we're carrying on, that's great. But hey, I, I got other things going on. Write that down somewhere. I got other things going on. I got, God is with me. 
He's working behind the scenes. He's doing things in my life. He's taking me somewhere great. He's taken me places, but he's taken me to more places and even higher levels. Here it is again in Daniel. He changes the times and the seasons. Daniel 2.21. He removes kings and raises up kings. So king James says, this is uh, New King James. King James says he sets kings up and he, take, he unsets them, takes them down. So when you're ready, God's already ready. I preached on this. Isaiah 60, 22 says, A little one will become like a thousand, a small one like a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in its time. He didn't say my time or your time. So this timing thing that a lot of people speak about is really erroneous, the way they say it. I, the Lord, will hasten it in its time. In other words, I was already ready. Now you have to be ready. And when you're ready, it's ready, Freddie, already ready. Ready, ready, already ready for you to come and take it all and seize the moment and have it all. And God was already there. He's standing there in the present. He's in the future already. He's in the past, present, and future. Uh, and scripturally, we see in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. He said, another scripture said, I am the Lord and I change not. But he says, but I change times and seasons for you, but I don't have to change because I'm already so powerful. I'm already so far ahead. I'm already so much there, way ahead of any of you could ever be. So I don't have to change because I, I already am everything. I don't just have everything. I am everything. <laughs> I don't mean that in the new age sense. You know, they try to say God is in everything. He's everywhere. He's everything. No, 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 no. He has the power of command over everything. He created everything. He's, he is not everything. But he's in everything, can do with everything, whatever he wants. But here's another rude awakening about, uh, let me talk about a productive relationship with your faith and your belief system, your BS. Bachelor of Science or belief system or something else. What does it mean? Where's the Lord? You'll get that later. Your BS, your belief system, uh, your, your relationship with your belief system and your faith to create. God is already there. He's already willing for you to have everything. We think, you know these people that go around saying God is in control? God is in control. That's, the, that's this popular doctrinal, God is in control. God is in control. Of what, you ask? Oh, you, people would say, of everything. No, he isn't. Is he in control of the crime? Is he in control of uh, other religions? What they do? Is he in control of uh, criminal acts that go on? Is he in control of all that? Is he in control of everything bad that happens? Did he do it? No. He didn't do it. Is he in control ultimately of what you do in your day? No, you are. With him, of course. See, we're not throwing out, we're not replacing it, the, the good thing of you with him and saying like it's one or the other. No, it's both, but you really have the responsibility. The onus, O-N-U-S, it's a word, the, or the manifestation, the oasis, the production factory, the, and the glory thereof, of things getting done in and through your life come from you taking action. Like this young man had a dream, 16 years old, left high school, made it, he had to make it. He said, I only had a year, or else I had to go back and submit to my father and go back to this boring high school that I don't see any benefit for. No benefit of it for me. I have a dream, I'm ready. So he says, I pushed extra hard, I worked extra hard, I was willing to do anything. I, that, that was Mr. Travolta, the actor. Now, Brad, uh, Pascal, who's the campaign manager, uh, Donald Trump's campaign manager, you know, to be Mr. Trump's campaign manager to a man that's a multi-billionaire, who the whole world is on the line. 
if this guy is his campaign manager, you know this guy is extra, extra good, yes? Mr. Trump is not going to take anyone that's like mediocre or second rate. He's going to have the best of the best. And this guy, this guy said, I had this gift when I was young. He said he didn't even own a suit until 2016 when he had to wear a suit to meet the president. And the president taught him the power of, of, of uh, presentation. You know, how to look great, how to dress smart, how to be uh, well, how to present yourself well. He said he was like a redneck kid. He just had, you know, he, he'd be doing all his sales and stuff with sneakers and shorts and a, and a T-shirt or some old shirt. He, he, he said he didn't even have a sport coat, sport jacket until 2014. He didn't have a formal really good suit until 2016. And this is a guy that's top of the world genius, but here's what he said about himself. He said, I don't know if I had the greatest gift more than anybody, but I knew I could outwork everybody. Nobody could outwork me. And he was diligent from when he was young. And he became very skilled and very successful. Someone lift your hands. Now, it's part of a productive relationship, productive relationship with your work, with people, also with your faith, with your belief system, with the renewing of your mind to believe that you're supposed to be living on a high level. That's a productive relationship. A relationship with yourself. I had somebody that really after me to, you know, devote some time to something. And, and I'm like, and I, I, I couldn't get to it. And I thought, I don't want to do it. My commitment is to myself. My commitment is to my own schedule. My commitment is to... What I feel I want to do, what I enjoy doing, what something comes up that's important, I have to be able to be spontaneous enough to change the program to do what I feel is the best use of my day and my time. And apology necessary or no apology necessary, I, wherever it fits. That's just how it is. But I made that decision. I had a businesswoman come up to me the other day, ran into me at a certain mall. And she says, we've all been watching you on Facebook. You don't know. We've been watching you online. You're such a blessing. A lot of people, they, they don't always click like. They don't always share the broadcast. They don't always like dive in and make a comment or whatever. But they're watching. Many people. You out there, you're, you're watching. I know you are. I know you're there. And she said, you, you posted something that's really been like, it's been troubling me. It's been convicting me. I've been really thinking about it. I said, your circumstances are not really just by chance, but they're by your choices. Your decisions, what you chose, what you allowed. And she said to me, that match that man of God, that's really been ringing my bell the last few days. I said, good, that obviously there's some things you want to change. And then uh, they took me to, uh, to see the shop, and right away I had instant visions of how to decorate, what to put here, how to advertise, how to get more sales in the shop, because you only have so much space in a, in a big, famous, known, expensive mall. Someone's walking past, you have like about two seconds to grab your attention, or they're going to keep walking. You have to put the message out why someone's going to want to buy something from you, that they can make a decision Everything has to be excellently arranged. You need to put your offers, put names of the brands and things on a sticker paper on the back wall where you have not just plain paint, whatever color it is. Decorate that thing. Make it like a big advert that when people see, shine spotlights on it, do whatever, get the thing rigged up. That when people see, they, they can come in there and feel like it's organized, it's elegant, it's excellent, it's over the top. And this thing here, uh, I need to know why I need that. I'll make a decision to buy it. And I said, your, sale, your sales will skyrocket. So let me tell you a few principles on that. Uh, oy, oy, oy. Let me see if I can find it here. I want to say it from my mind, but it's eight, eight keys that I wrote down. Here it is, eight things you need to be successful. Now, this is a relationship with your, with your yourself, your mind, your, your way of thinking, and then your actions. Relationship, not a dead relationship. 
not a dormant, stagnant relationship, not something that needs to be plugged back into the socket to get the juice flowing again. Something that's switched on. Number one is, they're all start with a P, the eight P's, okay? Here we go, another formula, I'm giving it to you. Number one is passion. You have to have passion in your heart. One of these guys said the only two things you need to succeed. He said you need to have the heart and you need to have the math. He said math doesn't lie, numbers don't lie. When you have a system that produces numbers, the numbers never lie. Mathematics doesn't lie, it is what it is. The formulation and the calculation of something, it is what it is. Are you learning anything? I know you are, this is brilliant. Number one is passion, number two, preparation. Like, and then in your heart, you either have it or you don't. You have the passion or you don't have it, okay? That's number one. Number two is preparation. You gotta prepare yourself. The scripture says, of course, study to show thyself approved unto God as a workman, needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Yeah, you have to have it all in you. You have to know what you're talking about. You have to have wisdom, knowledge, understanding, revelation, the counsel of the Lord, the word of the Lord in you, coming through you. But let's say you're in the realm of business, you need to prepare yourself for your audience, for your marketplace. Preparation. Number three is packaging. This is the, uh, leads to, number four, presentation. The packaging of everything. That you can present something with excellence. Let me tell you something. If you didn't have a relationship with the inside of you about your business life, your whatever you're doing, uh, you, you, you're not, uh, you're not going to make it big. It's just not going to happen. If you want to make it big, you got to hit it big. I love what Donald Trump said in all his books. He used to say this when he was on the speaking circuit before he was even thinking about running for president. He was the most popular man around before he was president and one of the most hated that ever lived in, on, the, on the face of the earth after he became president because the devils just don't want him to be doing all the good things he's doing. It's really bad. Someone said when people, enough people hate you, you know you're doing something right. Uh, well, when all people speak well of you, you'll have haters, right? He said, if you want to make it in anything, you have to start with the belief system that you're great and that you're, go not, not that you can do it, but that you will do it. I saw another guy that got up on the stage because he had success. He, he won a contest of, uh, as a presenter, you know. He picked him and he said, they gave him a questionnaire to fill out uh, to sign up this form and said, Check this box if you say, yes, include me in the possibility of being a person that's going to be on that stage, on the great stage here. He said, I, he said, he was standing there with his wife. He said he crossed it out, crossed the line out with a pen, and he rewrote up on the top. He said, I will be on the stage. <laughs> he didn't say tick, he didn't, he didn't leave it like tick here for the, possibility of an opportunity to be on the stage, he crossed all that out and said, I will be on the stage, and made it his mission. He won the contest, number one, and he's there, and he got to speak for about 15 minutes in this great convention. Think about it. And he put his business together, and it skyrocketed. He, had, he said he had to overcome like fear and insecurity and timidity and doubt and all of that to blast through all of that to get to where he's going. He had a relation, a, a productive, profitable relationship going on with his thinking. You understand? Packaging, presentation. Number five, product production. Production, product, what's your product? Number six, pursuit of your clientele. I mean, you gotta build relationships to get there. You gotta chase people, you have to get after it. I know one man of God, he became very successful in what he was doing. He said one regret he had in his life, he wasn't much of a reacher. He said, I was busy, I was successful, I was on top. Uh, 
He said, I wish I had reached for more people along the way. I wish I had overlooked some faults of some people and been able to have some kind of working system instead of just being like so opinionated and like overly successful. Good to be overly successful, but he said, I wish I had reached for more people. So you have to, we call that pursuit, number six. Number seven, purchases. People buying things from you, buying into what you're doing, connecting with you. That's success. And then it leads to this, number eight, profits. Thank God I didn't try to say this from memory because I wouldn't have been able to keep reading back, looking back at the point, 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 and, and adding things in between. I would have just had to read them off from my head. I wouldn't have been able to explain it so well. That's why we have to have notes, folks. Here we go. Notes in the phone, notes in the tab, notes in the notepad, notes in the iPad, notes in the computer, notes in the laptop. Got to have it. Number one, passion. Number two, preparation. Number three, packaging. Number four, presentation. Number five, product and production. Number six, pursuit. Number seven, purchases. Your pursuit will lead to purchases. And number eight, it turns into profits. Isaiah 48, 17 says, I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit and leads you in the way you should go. I've said a lot. I want to come in for a landing here. I'm not nearly done, but I'm just feeling I need to. Probably pick this up in another setting. Let me tell you a definition of relationship. I'm not nearly done. I'm just getting started, but I feel... Are you seeing the importance of having productive relationships? No man's an island, as they say. By yourself, well, you, you can't get much done. Now, I, I, I wish I could be more like a fireside chat, so to speak, sitting down, talking to sons and daughters, talking to people. I, there's a time coming for that, you know? But I, I, I mean, but I'm teaching here. I love this. I love this anointing. But there's some things in my heart that I want to say, like the, the purpose of community, the purpose of relationships to build something. It's so important. So I'm just going to say that right now, like a little announcement. The Lord's been talking to me all this week about that. And man, I got my hands out. I'm talking to people. I'm calling people that I wasn't calling. I'm talking to them more. We're getting more into the relationship. Every time you speak to a brilliant person, it's going to unlock something else. Someone wanted to give me some money, a nice, a nice offering, by the way. Not small. Not small. Not small at all. And they said, should we just meet like here and I give it to you or, or we have a coffee? I thought coffee, <laughs> did you want breakfast? No, I don't think I want breakfast. I have a cappuccino, and then I end up ordering like an apple muffin or something like that just to pick at it. You know, I don't want to eat uh, any whole meal, but let's do that. And sure enough, that was a wise decision. We sat there. God unlocked their brilliance again, and they spoke many more things. And then we went to another shop, and they bought a whole bunch of other things I needed. What if I just said, ah, I'm too busy. Now let's just pass in the way. Come on, relationship. Now, if you're with a, again, I got to say this. If you're with a dull person who has no resource ability, they're not, they don't have any resourcefulness. They don't have resources. They don't care. They don't want to help. They just, maybe they just want to take something from you. Uh, which short circuits the whole brilliance process because someone has to care to give. Like uh, John Travolta, he was saying how I wanted to help this brand. I wanted to help them. I, I wasn't just thinking about myself. He says, you got to, he said, Fran, he, here's a principle that he said that really, was really good. I just remembered it right now. He said, Fran, franticness, frant, being frantic, crazy in an environment, you know? He said, not much gets done. It kind of short circuits the whole thing. He says, you got to be, you got to slow down and get smooth and methodical and things begin to flow. And one thing can get done, which can lead to a whole string of other things getting done. Can't have a frantic environment. So he slowed himself down and said, what can I give to these people? Let me blow their mind. And he didn't say it like he's being a clever guy. He very, speaks very well, very eloquent, very, like with a very humble attitude. But you know, he's sticking in his mind. I'm brilliant. I have an idea that something's in it for them 
big too like it's in it for me. I'm not just thinking about myself. I'm thinking about how it's going to benefit. So like, like, and the guy who's putting on the convention, he's like, he's making millions of dollars from the whole thing, but believe you me. But he's not like, it's me, 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 let me squeeze you, whatever. He's bringing all this information to enrich people's lives as we want to help people, whether they mean it truly or not. Of course they do, because they're taking the action. You know, Jesus said, you don't have to just listen to what I say, watch what I do. <laughs> My works speak for how I really am. You know, I'm doing something for the world. So they're, they're giving out a lot of things. They're solving problems for people. They're giving a lot of information. I heard one guy, I'm going to have the video, by the way. I think the, the first week of uh, the coming month, they're going to have, have edited all the, the whole thing, and, they, and I'm going to have that uh, video. My God, that's things that, not, not for everybody. I'm not going to release, I'm not going to share that with everybody. But for certain particular people that need to talk, look about how marketing works. This guy brought it home. I never saw anything like this guy's presentation. He spoke so well, it was so brilliant, so powerful, so informative, so clear, and was invaluable. I mean, it was like the million dollar advice in 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Like you could easily make a million dollars off of what that guy said. If you could work with what he said. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm doing it, I'm gonna do it. You could easily make a million, easily. I mean, that would be the eventual reality of taking action and the steps he talked about, but really going for it, not just wishing and hoping and sitting back. Uh, let me say one more thing before I close. The, the other day I put a thing on Facebook and I had to take it down because uh, uh, I started getting the religious flack, the religious feedback. I said, I don't have the energy for this right now. I had to block some lady, she started talking rubbish, you know, like religious, religious mentality. I said, what is this doctrine, the lazy man's doctrine? You think you don't have to do anything. You know these memes that sound like real Christianette, Christianese, Christian savvy, you know, like relax in his presence, rejoice in his goodness, you know these kind of things? Hello. Uh, what, what's the other one? Trust in his timing, believe for his miracles. I tell you blithering idiots. You're still on this side of the fence of, of prosperity. Hello, lift your hands. I said, I'm going to preach this summer. I feel the anointing getting stronger right now. I need to say this because, but the religious mind, these church folks, they'll get offended at that. I said, are you saying like I shouldn't believe? This is what this lady says. Are you, what, what God are you talking about? I was like, what do you mean God am I talking about? What are you kidding me? Shouldn't I believe in his, shouldn't I rejoice in his goodness? Should, I said, I didn't say that. You shouldn't. I said, that shouldn't be all your emphasis and you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what your work is and you like these nice little Christian slogans that lead nowhere. If you believed in his timing, God had a, I'm, I'm, I'm going to help you now. God had a timing already. It's not like it's always the future. So uh, uh, the week, that was this week. The week before that, I got a, another startling revelation. I call it the wannabe realm. I talked about that earlier. Like everything's in the realm of, your people preach like there's something coming. You ever hear that kind of preaching? You hear it every day if you turn on anything. Lift your hands and be honest. You hear that kind of preaching every day through hundreds of different preachers and churches, ministries. If you turn anything on, you'll hear it. It's like, and I thought, wait a minute. Why is there always something coming? Why didn't it happen yet? Why can't you tell me about something you did and I can learn from you on what to do based on what you did? And here's these people in the world making billions and millions, running away with everything, being so blessed. And they didn't say anything about the, from the wannabe realm. They're not a wannabe, they are a bee. <laughs> they're the king bee, the queen bee. They, they didn't, they're not talking about what's going to happen yet. Oh yeah, I believe in God, I believe in God, yeah. Like, you know, like the slot machine, and, you know, let, let me put a coin in and go, See if it's gonna go seven, 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 ding, 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 and all the coins come flying out. I won. I, I don't know how it's gonna happen. I hope it's gonna happen. It may not happen. Don't know. Didn't happen yet, though. It didn't happen yet. This is the point. 
Everything's in the, you know, God's going to give a breakthrough. He's going to make me rich. He's going to bless me. Come on. We hear that kind of preaching all the time. I thought, where's the person? I know a few. I know a few, thank God. And I listen to them a lot. Where's the person that's already had some experience in that realm in the successful sense and can tell me about how they did it and what I can do? Not something that they're also hoping for. Hello? Wannabe. Wannabeism. To make a new word, put it in the dictionary. Wannabe, uh, quotation, ism, ISM. A philosophy about what could happen, what should happen, what I hope will happen, but it hasn't happened. That's the realm of wannabe. Let me tell you, if you will work in the principles correctly, according to the law of success which God released in the earth, for, ev for, for, for the opportunity for every living human being has the same opportunity to do something with their life, whether they be sinner or saint. Everything's not in the wannabe. It's like you're just waiting for it to happen around. I have a friend who's an apostle, and I love, he's identified himself in his calling. He's a speaker and an apostle. He's, he's a strategist. He's a teacher. He's a kingdom man. He's, a, he's coaching leaders. He's, he's doing a lot of things like that. He's not a pastor. He's not going to have no church. I admire that. Like, you don't see anything about church. He, he speaks in churches. He blesses churches. He blesses pastors, but he's not uh, trying to have a church himself. It's not his calling, and he knows that very well. So he's identified that. Uh, he, he said he went to this coaching uh, thing, a thing where you pay a fee and you go through the program there and you get certified through their organization. He said he's sitting there listening to the guy talk, the, one of the uh, trainers, not the head guy who's the visionary, but the, one of the trainers. And he got this feeling in his spirit like, I bet this guy hasn't really made any money, real money with what he's doing. So he went up to the guy at the end. He said, uh, let me ask you a question. I'm listening to you, and I just want to think, well, how long have you been making like six figures at what you're doing? Six figures in dollars would be like over 100000 between 100000 and $999,000. Six figures. One, two, three, comma, zero, 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 whatever the numbers is. There's six numbers there. Six figures. So it starts at 100, comma, 000, goes up to 999, comma, 999. Seven figures is when you hit the 1 million. 1, comma, 000, comma, 000. So how long, how many years, have, how long have you been making like, like, like great six figures in the business? He said, he, he said something funny. He says, I think the guy was Baptist. And then he just started, to, he's almost going to speak in tongues now. He went homa 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 like like he starts stuttering like he he's getting nervous he can't answer. He said, "I wonder if he's really a Baptist, but he's he's going to get Pentecostal now, Baptistical." Praise the Lord. And he and he couldn't answer, so he knows like no, he's never really made any money. So my friend, he said, "Well, I took this certificate because you know I paid for it. I was there. I got my certification." quote unquote, in this like coaching game, this coaching uh, seminar thing, training. But I'm not going to do anything with this. Because this guy is trying to teach people, listen to me, he's trying to teach people what he hasn't already done. If I never had any money in my life, let me tell you something real strong, I couldn't really tell you about the joy of having it. Because I wouldn't know what that's like. But that's not the case I've had. So I can tell you why you should have it also. I'm not talking about small money now. I'm talking about real, you know. So and this guy said, well, I'm going to make my own curriculum. He was doing that anyway. That's the calling that he has from God. And he said that even the famous ones that are doing this certification thing, I have stuff that's better and more relevant and up to date. Anyway, all that long story. But he discerned that the one that was trying to bring this out never had the experience. Again, it's like it's a futuristic thing. You're trying to prophesy or prophesy. lie. You're not testifying of the greatness of the fulfillment of what God did. You're still trying to get it to be worked up to happen yet, but you don't know what it's like. 
I want to prophesy apostolically, prophetically, however you want to say it, uh, in the realm of this anointing that is coming. That day has to end for many people in the church. Somebody lift your hands and get excited. It, it has to end where you're in the realm of wannabeism and you're in the realm of living in productive, power-filled relationships and you're getting somewhere, but you've also gotten somewhere. Let me tell you a real tragedy. I just see this real strong. Many things have not happened because of the lack of other people doing the right thing. Many things that were supposed to happen should have happened already. Like this man said, if I had these tools and I had the people and I had the relationships and I had the expertise and the things like this, he said now, uh, he's 60 years old, he said at 40 he would have had this level of success that he's at now at 60. And it's absolutely a statement of truth, no question about it. A lot of things don't happen because the right people weren't in place, but that has to end. I'm prophesying right now, as I'm landing the plane here, I'm going to pick this up in another setting. This is God, almighty God, that is going to manifest his power in himself to let people have a testimony of his goodness. Not this thing that we're praying, wishing, hoping, desiring, panting after what can happen, but we're reveling and rejoicing in what has already happened and what is about to happen is yet the more. And that is the will of God for his people. So be very careful about your associations and affiliations. Make sure you're listening to someone that knows something you don't know, that can take you somewhere you haven't been. Because they know it, it's in them, they've been there, they've been there, done that. Got the t-shirt and the custom shirt, and they know. Taylor, the tailor, they visited the tailor and the tailor has visited them. It's already like a wearing thing. They're wearing the thing already. It's not something that's yet going to happen. This is the word of the Lord. The power of productive relationships. Father, thank you for your touch. Thank you that you're changing the times and the seasons now. You're setting up some that have even been in a preparation stage or they were there and then not and then up. They've had these roller coaster rides in their journey of life for very many reasons. But there's this comeback from a setback. There's this setting up of, of, of the order and the empire that you're building because it's not just because it's time for it, but because it has to happen. It was supposed to happen. It is happening. It has happened, but it is happening, and it's yet being unfolded and fulfilled even more as we speak. Give people a testimony that they can tell other people, hey, God did this for me. Every time I'm praying for someone, they got a testimony. A lady the other day had a very, very delicate complication physically, very bad thing. Uh, oh, if they didn't get to the bottom, if, they, if that thing wasn't gotten to the bottom of it, it could have cost her a life. If it, got, if it went the wrong way. And God really put a witness in me, like a jump in me to pray for that. That this thing will be sorted, it'll be fixed. They're, they're, it's been fixed, they're completely healed, and they're out of the hospital right now. Now they could tell someone about what, they could go and tell someone about what God did for them because they received a miracle. Are you seeing what I'm saying? They're not talking about this like, I'm hoping for something, but I never saw it. How could you say you know God? You know him for real. You really believe him, and you haven't seen him do anything. Are you kidding? If God can have a middle name, he doesn't need any middle names. And Lord, please, I'm not trying to be, uh, for, uh, being far from me to be in any way disrespectful. I, I got to be careful how I say this. But let's say, just, just exploring with a word path here that I probably have no business saying. But if he did have a middle name, one of them would have to be manifestation. Hello, miracle manifestation, money manifestation, wealth and treasure manifestation, success manifestation, success comma INC, an entity, an enterprise, because that's that, that, because God has all that in him. 
And yet here we are, people are walking around, and even listening to successful people, but there's a disconnect somewhere. They're not catching it. How sad it is, but so what? We're, we're going right on uh, with it. Uh, are you seeing that? Are you seeing it? It's okay. It's still getting done. Things are getting done. But you know, so many people have this disconnect, whatever the disconnect is. And it's sad that they lose. Somebody said, with the stuff I use, you can't lose. He was a funny guy, but <laughs> can't lose with the stuff I use. He's talking about faith, too, also. Belief and faith. Positive mental, mental clarity. Donald Trump's pastor, even in New York, was... Uh, Norman Vincent Peale, the power of positive thinking. He had the, po the positive thinking doctrine. Well, guess what? If Donald got any uh, thing out of that, he became successful. Let me tell you something a lot of people don't know. I found this out this week. Also, I found this out. I didn't know it before. Uh, Donald, the word Donald means world ruler. Definition of the, of the word D-O-N-A-L-D, one of the definitions there is world ruler. Did that come to pass or what? The Donald. They call him the Donald in the business world. Now he's the Donald as a world ruler. He's really, he's really fulfilling his name. Let me, let, 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 me, let me wrap this by saying this. Relationship, a definition. Now I'm going to add something to it. But the noun, N-O-U-N, the noun relationship is the way in which two or more people or things are connected or the state of them being connected. The state of being connected and relationship being like uh, an action word is the way in which two or more people or things are connected. But I have to ask the question, okay, that's a good definition of the word. I mean, that's really what the dictionary would tell you. But for what? To produce something. To produce something. I prophesy that God will connect up the right people for the right reason, for the right thing, in the right now. In Jesus' name, for you. Receive that as the word of the Lord. And I am declaring this and believing in faith that it will happen in, with immediate effect. The right people for the right reason, for the right thing to be done in the right now. Somebody write that down. The right people for the right reason, doing the right thing in the right now. Right people, right reason, right thing, do it in the doing realm, in the right now. Lord Jesus, thank you for this. Right people, right reason, right actions, right thinking, of course. Let me add that. You gotta have that to get somewhere. You gotta start thinking right. You gotta think right before you can act right, in the right now. Right people with the right thinking, oh yes. Doing things for the right reason in the right now. In Jesus' name. That is the word of the Lord. I want to hear your testimony. And also, you need to sow into this grace, this brilliance of revelation that's flowing. You need to sow into this. The information will be on the screen. It's also on my website, thomasmanton.com. Uh, uh, I want to add another uh, banner of all of the contact information on how you can sew on the website. It's there. You can actually sew on the website. You can use that. You can use PayPal. You can use Cash App. You can use M-Pesa. You can use the website portal directly. But uh, you need to, to, to sew into the grace of this brilliant flow of God's revelation expecting the same to manifest for you. That you no longer remain a wanna, but you, <laughs> you actually have become a bee. 
of being, doing, having. Psalm 23, the psalmist even said it. I sit in the, at the table you've set before me in the presence of my enemies, and I'm blessed. It's already a done thing. It wasn't something that was always going to happen. It had already happened. And that needs to be your testimony, too, in Jesus' name. Make sure you sow and connect and tap the grace. I also will receive your prayer requests. You can write me on Facebook. You can write me on WhatsApp. It's all the details, you'll have it. Use them because out of sight, out of mind. You know, if I don't see you, how can I pray for you? You need to present yourself and also with an offering because the Bible said, don't come before the Lord empty-handed. Give him something. David, when he said on the threshing floor, I'm going to give an offering, I'm going to not come to the Lord empty-handed in 1 Samuel, uh, or was it 2 Samuel chapter 24, 25? Yeah, the bat we call it the battle seed. He said, I'm not going to come before the Lord empty-handed. I'm going to give him something that costs me something. And in the footnotes there, I studied it out. They said it was a bunch of silver that he had that was worth $6,400. That bunch of silver coins or pieces of silver, whatever he had, some silver that he had, just he just had it. Was worth, he said, I'm going to bring this as an offering to the Lord. $6,400 of silver. $6,400. How much is that in shillings? 650000 640,000 shillings in Kenyan money. So that's just a by-the-way offering because I can't come to the Lord with my hands empty. I've got to give him something. So let me grab this bunch of silver. At least it's 650,000. At least it's 6,400 dollars. At least that. He's the one that gave millions of dollars, billions even for the building of the temple in gold. Remember Solomon says 666 uh, 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 the, the measure of weight, whatever it was, of gold was laid at his feet in one year. And they said it was about almost four billion U.S. dollars. I think it was 3.83 billion, with a B, U.S. dollars. Now, that, that's too much in shillings. That's trillions of shillings. Many trillions of shillings. Can't even count. That kind of money. Almost four billion dollars of gold to build a temple. And it was worth more than that. They had more than that. Do you know the seraphim uh, statues in the temple were, were worth more than one million dollars each. To carve that, the gold that was in it, the value uh, in, in, a, in an equivalency of done just a few years ago, not even now, was about a, a million bucks, a million dollars just for one of the statues that, sat, that stood there. Someone thought, well, isn't that a waste of money? I don't know. Ask David. Ask Solomon, they'll tell you. They'll laugh at you. They say, you think that was a lot? We had a lot more than that. Ha, ha, ha. Look now, we please the Lord. We're all in glory with him. So how about you? How are you doing with your broke self? Half broke self. Hello. You, this is the relationship with the word, relationship with revelation. We need to work that in us and see it produce what the Lord wants to bring us to. And let it not be just always in the future realm, like maybe it could happen, hasn't happened, but it's actually our experience and our testimony in Jesus' name. Amen. So take action, get busy, sow a seed. Your tithes, your offerings, your first fruits, you know, belong in the storehouse of Revelation. And of course, that's right here. I look to hear from you. And please add your prayer requests. I want to pray for you. In Jesus' name. I'm Thomas Manton IV. Love you so much. Talk to you on the next broadcast. Remember the words of our great, great, great ancestor in the prophetic, the prophet Isaiah, when he said in Isaiah 48, 17, I am the Lord your God who will teach you to profit and lead you in the great way that you should go. In Jesus' name. God bless you. That's my prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen.